Well, thank you. Thank you. It's an honor to be here. Um, and basically, right after hearing Chris's talk, uh, he pretty much said way more, but what I'm going to say only in a much more organized and articulate manner. So uh, with that said, I guess I'll get started. But real quick, I want to tell you guys that um, the National No-Till Conference is in Louisville this week, and I made the trip up there Wednesday to listen to some speakers and heard some great talks on cover crops and soil biology. That's what seems like the high points or the, the main thing that everybody that I heard talk was talking about. Um, Ray Archuleta from NRCS always gives good talks. He spent his I think he's recently retired from NRCS, I believe. Um, he spent his whole life teaching people about soil, soil health, cover crops, multi-species cover crops. And Dr. Coyne, I think you'll appreciate this. When he gave his talk Wednesday, he, um, he said after you know, spending most of his life talking about soils, what are soils, the main tripod that makes up soils is the physical properties, the chemical properties, and the biological properties of soil. And he said, we've always taught, and I was taught, and I've taught many, many people that those are equal portions. And he said, about eight or 10 years ago, I decided that there's, that's all wrong. The biological portion is by far the more important component of the three components of soil. And then his slide he put up for that was a picture of Earth, a picture of Mars, and then he said, same physical, same chemical, what's missing? It's the biological. And that, I think that's a great point, and I thought you might appreciate that, but I also feel like, from my experience on our farm, our farm, that the biological component of soil helps us to make up for some of our mistakes we may make on the chemical or the physical properties. So if, when we get some of the uh, mineral balancing wrong in our fertility program, or when we continually till it too much, um, it's the biology that's able to, it's kind of the eraser for our mistakes, and it's the biological component that, keep, that seems to be resilient and keeps making the soil properties work, soil work on our farm for us. Um, so real quick on, uh, on our farm, who I am, 550 acres, just 30 minutes, well, 10 miles, 15, 20 minutes north of here in Scott County, Georgetown. Um, of the 550 acres, we can crop a little over 200 of it. Um, 350 acres is pretty much in permanent pasture. Um, presently, we raise cattle, sheep, pigs, poultry, and turkeys, broilers, and layers. Um, fruits and vegetables, from primarily annuals, some perennials, and then grain for the poultry and pigs. Um, and we market primarily retail and a small amount of wholesale. Uh, the grain is fed mostly for the livestock. We market the excess a little bit. We hardly ever sell any hay. Um, first year generations that have, we haven't raised tobacco on the farm. So there's a picture of it, I think, planting some onions and lettuce or something. There's cattle in the background. You can barely see the dots back there. So growing crops and livestock together are basically the fundamental keystone of of our operation. It was taught, uh, like many of us, you know, it's it, growing up in central Kentucky, we have a lot of land that can't be cropped, so a lot of us have grown up growing crops and livestock, or, or at least introduced to that. Um, but it was taught by my grandfather and my father as a fundamental thing. You don't mess up, you don't mess with this. This is something that's fundamental to the success and longevity of this property and this soil. Um, so as I, a lot of my peers and friends are still maybe own some cattle, um, but they do a lot more cropping on the crop land, a lot more less, a lot less rotation. So the cattle are kind of left on the pastures. We've stuck with it, so we've maintained this rotation of cattle through the crop land and back. So the crop land is sometimes grazed and sometimes raising crops. That's what I'm trying to say. And I think that's the success. The reason why our farm has been productive as it has for how long it has. It's for multiple reasons, physical and economic, that it works, I think. Um, 
So when you have both crops and livestock on the same property, there's an opportunity to add value. So as Chris was saying, we don't have to haul off tons and tons of hay and sell to sell hay to make a living. Instead, we feed the forages to our cattle. Vice versa, on the crop side, when we raise grain, we're feeding it to livestock. We're adding value to it, so we're not having to haul tons and tons of grain off the farm. It reduces risk. We're, you know, we have more than we're not specialists at any one thing, but we also have, you know, we're kind of our own insurance policy, so to speak. By having so many different crops and livestock on the same property, it's kind of our own risk management both economically, so whenever something's boom or bust, we make a little bit on the boom, but we're not ruined if it's a bad year on tomatoes or something like that, market-wise. But also weather-wise. When there's a flood, you know, my tomatoes might be eat up with blight and mold and mildew, but the cattle are usually pretty fat because they're in forage up to their belly. Vice versa, with a little bit of irrigation, dry weather's the best time to grow vegetables if you have a little bit of irrigation because disease is usually but it's a very small issue. You know, I might be hunting some pasture, my, gra my cattle might be looking for something to eat, but maybe the produce is doing pretty well. But the main thing I want to talk about in this talk is cutting cost by having the livestock cattle rotation. Um, no feed, no fertilizer. So I don't have a feed cost because I'm not buying in feed from my livestock. I'm growing it on my farm. No fertilizer. And what I mean by that is primarily nitrogen. We do mineral balance the soil, so the way our fertility program on our farm is to mineral balance the soil in a big picture, long term, we don't buy any fertilizer other than the greenhouse transplant production. We don't buy any off-farm fertilizer to feed any particular crop for one year. Primarily that fertilizer that we buy is lime for calcium and then um, potassium sulfate. And both of those is kind of on a six, eight, ten year is about how long before we have to reapply it. We're fortunate, that for those of you in this area, you know that we're on high phosphorus soil, so we don't really have to, haven't had to add much. So by adding value, um, we're hauling fewer tons of stuff off the farm. So as I alluded to, not having to haul hay, but instead um, feeding it to the livestock. So we're, we're selling you know, either a head of, you know, one head of beef instead of a few tons of hay. Or better yet, we're selling a few ounces of steak rather than a few tons of hay. Or on the other side, we're selling a pork chop rather than a semi-load of grain. So that's adding value. But the other thing that's doing is we're not hauling tons of stuff out the front gate. The more stuff that leaves your farm, the more stuff you either have to generate, make, or buy, or bring back into your farm physically, talking about pounds. So that's fertility and inputs. So, the, so by adding value, we're having, we have less stuff to replace in terms of nutrients. So the, then the next step to continue the conversation on the, the biology and the forages and, and making cattle work for us on our farm, by the way we graze our forages in this rotation on our cropland, we're able to make our cows pay us to not buy fertilizer. We make a few hundred dollars an acre when that crop land is in the pasture stage of the rotation, those cows make us a few hundred dollars an acre. But that builds the fertility up in the soil. We're banking the fertility. That we turn around and mine for a few years on cash crops where we make a few thousand dollars an acre. So, The fundamental free lunch is photosynthesis. And so this is my attempt to either explain how this works on our farm, or I'm, you know, I was taught this. I was taught this is the way we farm, but I have to kind of understand. So this is basically my simplified version of why this rotation, why this ruminant cash crop, ruminant cash crop rotation has worked well for us. So Photosynthesis is a free lunch. Um, it's, it's combining water and carbon dioxide. It's taking the, the, the free lunch part is the sunshine. That is energy, and it's forcibly combining these two things together. And once something's been done under force, there's a latent potential of energy there. So we call it carbohydrates or calories or whatever, but that is something that 
that is a battery, that is something that has, that's holding energy that we can capture and utilize down the road if we need to. So what can be done with this energy that's the result of photosynthesis? The plant, so sun shines, carbon dioxide and water are joined to make sugar in the sap in the plant, and that sugar is the energy. That plant can use that sugar itself as energy to build cells and combining the minerals and nutrients from the soil and the plant grows. Or something can eat that plant, but it has captured that energy and taken it to the next level. It's recycled it, it's used it, it's still available, it's just an animal form instead of plant form. Um, it can be stored in other forms like root exudates, it can, be, it can make uh, organic matter in the soil so the energy can be stored in another manner or it can be lost back in the atmosphere. So anytime you have a forage above ground that just turns brown, or we harvest it and haul it away, that is that energy, that captured energy, that potential battery of, of growth that has been lost or missed. So when we have a forage growing, a perennial grass, a perennial forage or a cover crop, we're doing the first three things. We are keeping that captured free sunlight in, we're keeping it working, and that's a, that's a form of stored energy by keeping it busy. Once it turns brown and volatilizes and decomposes, what's below ground is not lost, but you've lost the top half. Anytime something is standing upright and turns brown, you've lost a good portion of potential nutrients and captured energy there. So CC means a cash crop. So when I've halt, that is sunlight that has been captured and it's either turned brown like corn, the fodder's turned brown, and then I harvest the grains of corn, or the head of cabbage I've hauled off the farm, then I've, I've removed that potential energy. So I'm depleting my energy supply from the soil. So how do ruminants increase fertility and build soil for our cash crops? The growing of gra and grazing of legumes captures and builds nitrogen. The whole time we are not tilling the soil, but it's in a permanent pasture, is, it gives the biology in the soil a place to live. We have built it and they are coming. So until we start the tilling action, biology is multiplying and um, proliferating. And then there's a, also an increase in soil organic matter the whole time it's in a perennial pasture or a cover crop pasture, annual pasture. So the first part, the nitrogen. So I've always had this concern, where are we going to get the nitrogen if we don't buy it and bring it in? Well, as Chris talked about, um, legumes working with some bi um, biology in the soil can capture and store a lot of biology. And we've been told that through great many conferences and classes and probably our family and our parents and grandparents. So we know that to be the case. We know that legumes inoculated are going to capture and build nitrogen. The hard part is maybe believing how much is possible and trusting them to do it. But the bad side is, so it's kind of laying, it takes a lot of trust, but if you don't trust the legumes to build the nitrogen and we supply them with some, then they're not going to build it to begin with because we've already supplied it. So that's the, the catch-22 that it's hard to get away from. Trying to, trying to cover your bases and be safe, we've kind of already started the process of the legume maybe and the bacteria and the, the biology in the soil not working for us as hard as it could. So a quick example of this, I tried to, to support that argument, I tried to find a few examples. Here's a, uh, the point of this is um, we know, so I'm talking about soybeans here because this was what I found the research for, but it's, it's the case for all legumes. If we inoculate it, it's going to fix some nitrogen. We just don't know exactly how much, but this is a recommendation out of Missouri Extension. It's saying a crop following soybeans, you can give the, soy, the previous crop, the soybean crop, a 30 to 50 unit of N credit. So whatever, you know, like if you're grazing corn after soybeans, you can take 50 pounds of uh, nitrogen off the 150 you're going to put down. But here is a study out of Canada that says soybeans can actually capture, generate 
134 pounds of nitrogen per acre. And then here's another study that's saying basically not only does the soybean capture and utilize all the nitrogen that it needs, it's also, if there's things there to utilize it in terms of biology asking for it in response, it's going to generate 30 to 50 pounds more than it's going to utilize itself in terms of root exudates and, and drippings and that the biology in the soil or the grass growing right beside it is going to utilize. So if we don't supply the nitrogen and trust it to work, the legumes can, can produce not only as much as they need. So we know that we know that when we plow under a clover and alfalfa, we get the benefit of that captured nitrogen in that plant. But what I'm saying is, besides that, it's, it's documented that they also produce an excess if there's things next to it asking for it and needing it, if it's formed a symbiotic relationship with some mycorrhizal in the soil. So that is that was my getting comfortable with the fact that, yeah, we can generate some nitrogen with legumes in this rotation, so maybe we don't have to buy it like I was wanting to do. Um, so the next step is, when the cattle are in this permanent pasture, it's also an opportunity for building biology in the soil. It, 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 it improves the soil structure and the soil health, as has already been talked about, but also, this was a big deal to me when I finally made this connection. It was an aha moment for me. Biology in the soil is animals. Animals are made up of protein. Protein are chains of amino acids of basically nitrogen. So protein and nitrogen are the same thing. And so these eight head of cows we have underneath of our one acre that's grazing one cow on top, there's eight head the Dr. Coyne said, of livestock underneath the soil, that's all protein. That's all potential nitrogen if I need it. So that is a second source or reserve or battery of nitrogen. As biology dies off, that nitrogen goes somewhere. The plants take, up, take it up and can grow. So that was a big, I knew biology was good and I knew that it had all these symbiotic relationships, but it was finally a duh moment. Biology is, is alive. It's protein and it's potential nitrogen. So this is a little wordy part, but I wanted to make sure I try to get my point across, I guess. A plant needs nitrogen to grow, and it can be directly supplied, to, it can directly be supplied to the plant in the form of nitrate. The plant is spoon-fed exactly the elemental component needed to grow. It's what I would call chemical farming. It involves amazing scientific knowledge and is perfectly exemplified by the hydroponic growing of beautiful vegetables that never touch a thimble of soil. But the nitrogen can also be supplied to plants from amino acids through equally amazing biological processes performed by diverse biology in the soil. This is what I would call biological farming. And it's the result of a huge web of billions of tiny livestock living in the soil, performing many different tasks while alive, and then becoming food for other microbes and or plants once dead. But if we're not farming biologically from the beginning, then we'll not have the biology available in the soil when we need it. If we feed the plant directly chemically, give it the nitrate that it needs right off the bat from the beginning, then there's no reason for the plant to form a symbiotic relationship with nitrogen-fixing bacteria and nitrogen-scavenging fungi. Then, if the plant runs low on nitrogen or water or is attacked by a pathogen like a root rod, th those symbiotic micro microorganisms are not there with a vested interest and a documented capability to defend the plant and protect it, their host. So then that's cool. If, if right off the bat, these two neighbors form this relationship, the biology has a vested interest to protect that host plant. But if we don't allow that by just wanting to use a seed starter to begin with when we plant our seed in the ground, so to speak, we're discouraging that relationship to be started at the beginning. So that was, that's the trust factor. But I see it happening, and that's what it is working on our farm. 
So thirdly, grazing livestock in a crop rotation increases organic matter. And organic matter is really important in soil structure because it acts like a sponge. And it's a sponge that can hold both water and air. So just like the importance of the, the boreholes of earthworms and the biology brings to the soil to make the soil permeable, places to hold uh, roots to grow, but to hold air and to hold water, organic matter does the exact same thing. So organic matter is a great source of both air and water holding capacity. It's also a nutrient itself because it's made of carbon and other minerals. So as organic matter breaks down, it's a nutrient source for your crops. And then finally, it's a organic matter is a receptor site or a battery or a fuel tank to hold a certain set of minerals or nutrients in the soil. So the, the, it's a cation, so it holds things like calcium, magnesium, potassium. And so as you increase organic matter in your soil, you're increasing your water holding ability, but you're also increasing the nutrient holding ability, the magnets that hold on to calcium or magnesium or potassium in your soil. So if ruminants can build soil for cash crops while making us money as well, how do we take advantage of this at Elmo's Stock Farm? So this is how our system works to try to encourage what I just described is happening. We rotate crops and livestock, the, may, the way we manage our grazing and the way we feed our hay. So we have an eight year crop rotation, three years of crops, food or grain, and then five years of cows doing their magic. We try to have as little bare ground as possible. So that's, a, that's a missed opportunity of photosynthesis taking place and Anytime it's bare, you're also, what has already taken place, there's a chance of it being lost through volatilization. So 350 acres, permanent pasture, so we're not talking about that anymore. The 200 acres of cropland is eight year rotation, so it's divided into 25 acre plots. So we plow sod right there, plow sod, Second year ground, third year ground is the way I call it. Um, so on the vegetable side, this would be tomatoes, the high value, high nutrient demanding crops. That would be tomatoes, peppers, uh, potatoes, bean, uh, not beans, uh, some sweet corn, um, eggplant. Second year, um, in the row crop, this would be corn. So we're turning under five years of rested, rejuvenated, highly fertile soil, we're gonna plant our corn crop there. Second year ground would be um, soybeans. And then the soybeans are gonna kind of feed themselves by fixing nitrogen and put some nitrogen back in the soil to feed wheat. So corn, soybeans, wheat. Um, on the vegetable side, it's high value. Then this is actually more the convenience of spring and fall transplanted coal crops. And then the third year ground is where the legumes go, peas and beans. So really fertile soil. We're mining the nutrients for three years. And then it goes back into five years of pasture that we graze with livestock. So just the rest of loan and being five years in pasture allows the nutrients to build back up to a certain degree. But also the way we manage our grazing helps to build the nutrients in that five-year cycle as well. Um, so with managed grazing, electric fence, portable water, you can manage your livestock in a way that is the benefit to the livestock, a way that maximizes the forage production, or in a way to build soil. And so we do all three. Um, we do, we, we fit grass finished beef. And so those animals are pretty much grazed in a manner that's gonna benefit the animal because we're trying to get them the high energy diet that's gonna put fat on because we're grass finishing beef to choice. And it takes a lot, a lot of energy to do that. And it's, you know, certain forages have a ton of energy if you, at certain times of year. But those cattle are grazed in a manner that benefits the cattle. And then the yearlings and the cows, 
to some degree are grazed in a manner that's most efficient use of forages because we're trying to make some money here. So there's times when we're grazing everything, you know, graze 40%, leave 60%, get back on it as, you know, right before it goes to seed. We're trying to maximize our forage production because we need to make some money. But then we also, we make the cows work for us. And so there's times when we do mob grazing, which what I mean by that is very intensive, high impact, short duration grazing and a long recovery. And we do that on the cropland. Because what, what we're doing then is all of this photosynthesis, all of this captured energy, all this potential energy to grow something, when the green forage is at its maximum size, we either want to eat it off and poop it out the back or trample it in contact with the soil so it's captured. If you get the forage in contact with the soil, then the soil biology can bring it, break it down and take it into the soil. If it's left standing or if it goes, gets mature and goes to seed, um, then that is kind of missed opportunity because there's a lot of volatilization and a lot of the potential nutrients and energy above ground have been lost. So we use mob grazing purely as a soil building process. We don't do our finishers mob grazing, we just do the cows. We make the cows work for us. They have a really good life, but they do have to work there too. Um, so there's, there's, we don't mob graze only on the cropland. We do some, you know, it's a lot of times it's alfalfa and orchard grass, or alfalfa, it's, you know, a, a clover grass mix. So we'll take some hay off of there and we'll do, we'll graze the finishers through there kind of at the optimal stage when it's really productive for them. But it all gets mob grazed some at least once a year on that five years of rest period. So there's some time where we are letting it get pretty rank and then we're cramming it into the soil either as manure or as trampled down as litter. So that's how we speed up the soil building process. And then finally, the way we feed hay. So we do, we, we feed less hay than we used to. I still have uh, one group that hasn't, I haven't fed hay to yet. I'm gonna get, I think I'm gonna make it to the first of February before I have to feed them. The other group we've started, I have a strong inclination or interest in trying to not feed hay, but it's actually an important component of our soil building for our croplands, so I think we will always feed hay to a certain degree. And what that is is we take hay off of the entire farm but the only place we ever feed hay is on the crop ground. So we were actually physically moving nutrients from the permanent pasture, what I call the lazy fields because they're never cropped, by feeding, taking hay there but only feeding it on the crop ground, we're physically moving nutrients on the farm. But we're not bringing it in the front gate. You know, that's the closed system, I guess. It, we're not, I'm not having to buy it, I'm just making one part of my farm try to help the part that has to work the most. And it's, you can't really see it very well, but we unroll it, as, as I'm doing there. But it's, we stripe it pretty good, and of course, there's a whole lot of manure where the cattle stand there and eat hay. And it, it gets sacrificed pretty good. For that reason, we almost always feed at least the majority of the winter on the field we're getting ready to put back into production, because we're going to till it up anyway. So... We're not too worried about the pocking or the uh, destruction of the alfalfa, so to speak. So that's the, the process. So basically, we learned to stop using manufactured fertilizer almost entirely. Like I said, lime, sulfate of potash on a six to 10 year basis, and then a handful of nutrients we use in our transplant production in the greenhouse. Healthy, biologically busy soils and legumes can make that nitrogen if we don't provide it, is what we've learned. Cover crops and soil biology can hold on to it in preparation for the cash crops. There's an increasing amount of university and NRS, NRCS research that shows significantly declining yield bumps in corn on increasing in rates in biologically healthy soils. So what I'm saying is that, to me, that was kind of evidence that, yes, a super biologically active healthy soil 
has a lot of the nutrients that the corn crop already needs there because as um, tests are showing, as you apply outside elemental in, the more biologically active the soil is, the less reaction they're getting to the increased in levels. In other words, the corn doesn't need it or much. And then the downside is when you do provide in that's in excess of what's needed, um, it invites the soil biology that has its excess in before it leaches or runs off. They eat the in, they consume, the biology will consume the organic matter to go with the in. So they're utilizing the in, but they need the carbon from the organic matter. So in, when you have excess in in your soil, besides wasting money or the chance of losing it through leaching, you're also taking a chance on inviting the soil to actually decrease, not increase organic matter with it. And Ray Archuleta at the same talk pointed out, talking about the issues, not of not using in, he was talking about excesses, but he said, he was talking about, again, some of this research showing that how much of the fertility that biology can provide he said 150 units of N. So like if you raise 150 bushel corn and you apply 150 bushel of N like we've all been taught, that's equal to a 600 mile car ride that you apply on every acre every year. So if there's other ways to get these hydrocarbons, if there's other way to get this captured sunshine, you might ought to look into it. And that's what we're trying to do. Because again, photosynthesis results in captured stored hydrocarbons. It's just it's free if you get it on your own farm from photosynthesis and your cover crops or your forages versus having to haul it in, buying it, hauling it in. So does all this work on our farm? Economically, I grew 130, so I'll say this right off the bat, I'm not a corn farmer, I'm not a grain farmer. We grow grain, but it's low on the priority. We get our, our cash crops out first, which is the vegetables, the high value cash crops. So with that said, I mean, I do grow it every year. So this, this like this past, this year, corn was planted around early June because we had, we had some wet weather and we had to get all of our produce planted first. So it's not always given the best chance to grow. I grew 130 bushels of corn, 50 bushels of soybeans last year with no purchased inputs other than the seed, and the fuel, and the equipment. We're certified organic. So when you're not buying fertility, when you're generating your own fertility on your farm, to become certified organic, there's headaches with weed control, and there's headaches with insect pest control. But the big hump or hurdle to get over long term is fertility is trying to buy enough organic fertilizer. It's very bulky and it's very expensive. So because my granddad made us do cover crops and crop rotation with livestock, fortunately, once I've recognized the, the wisdom in what he was having us do, it may become certified, become certified organic pretty simple for us. So we're certified organic, helps in our retail sales of our produce, also helps in corn sales. So 120, uh, just for example, last year I did 130 bushel corn 100, or 50 bushel soybeans, but here's a little figure. 125 bushels of organic corn at $10 a bushel minus the seed cost. So that's my gross per acre. 40 bushels of organic soybeans, $25 a bushel seed minus the seed cost. That's the gross. Wheat. Okay, so we're selling steaks, but I did this by if I sold an or uh, grass finished choice beef at two dollars a head live weight, um, and then I'm figuring a cow or calf yearling finisher, so four head, but I mean it's a it's a calf and it it's not four cow units, but a cow either calf in the belly or calf on the side yearling finisher on four acres of pasture or four acres of land. So that's, that's my, and that's more than enough. It's really, we can do it a little bit more efficient than that, but that's very conservative and we can do that very easily. So with that, what, that, what I'm trying to get at is that comes down to the beef off of 
an acre and a quarter, or that would be one and a quarter beef off of the that eight acre rotation. Minus that annual or decade long lime and potassium. So on my eight acres, three years growing crops, five years growing beef, I'm I don't know, gross, it's not gross or net, but 5025 an acre before rent, fuel, my labor and stuff. So that's 625 an acre per year. So what I'm getting at is that's, that's what I'm doing by not cropping every acre every year. I'm still making 625 an acre before I pay rent or pay myself. So I'm not having to farm or crop fence row to fence row, and I'm and I'm still making decent money in acre, on an acre basis. So that's the economic way to look at it. Ecologically, we mine the soil for three years, growing and hauling high value cash crops out of the fields. Are we? Re, is it working? Are we in those five years? Are we rebuilding the soil? Are we at least staying even, or are we slowly depleting our soils? So UK was kind enough to do some research for a few years to try to answer that question. Um, they came out and pulled soil samples four times a year on those five years that were not in the crop field. So what they're looking at is the first year after corn, soybeans, wheat, the first year back into sod, they pulled soil samples. And for the five years, I was slowly, I'm hoping, building my fertility back they were looking at that, and then the control was some of the permanent pasture that's never cropped. So they were comparing the biology, the carbon, and something else. They looked at three different things. Yeah, nitrogen, soil and nitrogen. Preliminary data shows that soil biology, carbon, and nitrogen does deplete from the cropping, but trends back up when in the pasture and it's approaching the permanent pasture level in the fourth year. So that was encouraging for me that, yes, so I thought the system was working, but this kind of validated it from a third party, I guess, for me a little bit. Um, a different study that we were involved in with George, University of Georgia, in a joint project, three-year project with Georgia and UK, looking on energy use on the farm. So, what the, the main question is, the ultimate sustainability question is, how much, how many calories does it take to generate a calorie of food? And if it's taking more than a calorie, it's probably ultimately not sustainable. We're going backwards. And it does. It takes way more than a calorie. But just some, well, so there's, there's a lot of different ways to look at it. But uh, Michael Pollan's book, said something about 10 calories, but Mike Bomper, when he was at KSU, did a pretty in-depth research, and he said it takes 12.4 calories of inputs to generate one calorie of food that the, a consumer in the United States eats. And so that is the calories that it takes to drive the tractor, to spread fertilizer, to dry the corn, or to harvest the livestock, but it's also the calorie it takes for the hand labor, you get into the real sticky point is, and all the researchers can't agree on, do you also include the calories in the diapers raising the farm worker and then the retirement home after they are no longer useful on the farm? So that's where the numbers get really questionable, I guess, when you're comparing from one person to another. But somewhere around there, 10, 12, 15 to 1 is the calories it requires to, to create or generate one food calorie for us to eat. On our farm, we're still really inefficient. It took 7.5 calories to generate one calorie of food, but we're better than the average. So that's encouraging. It's discouraging, but it's encouraging. And you'll notice that of the top four, none of it was fertility related. Human labor, fuel, because there is a lot of tillage on our production on the, the cropping years. 
electricity and machinery. Okay, the last way I wanted to look at this was on our farm. So we have a system that's working on our farm and economically we are able to make a living and we're not requiring too many inputs off the farm. But am I ultimately, is this too low of yielding? Am I, am I not going to be able to contribute to the mandate of farmers around the world to, to feed the world? And so I did this quickly using Google. So I can't vouch for any of the data, but I tried to put up where I found it. So roughly, Google says there's seven and a half billion acres of arable land in the world and roughly seven and a half billion people in the world. So basically, there's an arable acre per person to produce food on. Uh, the economist, I got from the economist, instead of calories or whatever, they put it in tons. They said the average American consumer consumes a ton of food a year. So in our rotation, on, not on the, on the row crop, but on the cash crop, the vegetable side, if we grew, the first year grew tomatoes, second year grew kale, and third year grew sweet potatoes, giving our average and conservative yields of those crops, and then years five through eight, we grew beef that we could produce from that 5,000 pounds of produce and 80 pounds of meat per year per person. You know, if, if, this, if our system was spread worldwide. Because there's a lot of land way better than ours and there's a lot of land way worse than ours. So I know, I mean, I know this is ridiculous, but still I just had to think about it in a world view, I guess, to know whether I should be okay with the way we're farming. That boils down to we're able to produce more than twice the amount of food that a person needs in a year in produce and three and a half ounces of beef every day for every man, woman, and child in the world. So I felt pretty comfortable that our system, far from perfect at all, because we're still using a ton of energy to produce a calorie of food, but I feel comfortable that our system is not uh, contributing to a, a negative impact on the food production in the world. I feel like we're a positive influence and it's something to continue to work with rather than to scrap and start over in a different direction, I guess is the best way to put it. I needed to be comfortable with what we were doing and this helps. I think that's all. That's all I have. Thank you. Yep. Sir? Thank you. Let's get a question. Any questions? Yes, sir. Uh, from an economic standpoint, are you saving money or breaking even with your grade on corn? So I feel like I'm making money because the, the question was, am I, do I feel like economically, am I helping or hurting myself by feeding my grain to livestock rather than selling the grain? Um, so I'm selling grain at, at, at $10 a bushel corn, for example. Um, this year it's nine, but last year it was 10. Uh, if I'm not feeding it, I'm gonna have to buy that. But I'm, so, so I feel like I have the, don't have the transportation, I don't have, so I feel, when I do my budgets for my pigs, even though I'm feeding my own corn, I'm charging, my, I'm selling the corn to my pig operation. Does that make sense? And so, I'm still making money with my pigs, and I'm not having the headache or the transportation issues. And I know it's I know you know it's my corn; it's there. So economically, I'm trying to account for it 100%. So I guess you could say, from the corn point of view, it might be a wash. But from the pig point of view, it's probably cheaper. Or from the pig point of view, it's a wash, and I'm saving money by not having to haul the corn, however you want to call it. But I feel like it's to my advantage. It is. 
on the, but from the produce side, I see a lot of waste there, you know, both delivering and where we, one, even before it leaves our, after it leaves our farm, um, there's a lot of waste before it even makes it to the restaurant table or to the grocery shelf. It's ridiculous because we as customers are always going to buy the perfect best looking stuff. I mean, I do it. You know, I go to the grocery. I'm going to buy the best looking thing. So that's human nature, but it's ridiculous. Yes, sir. So the question was uh, basically how difficult have, have we made the rotation and how much labor does it take? How much time do I spend daily moving cattle? Um, it's, it's a fair question and we have not invested a whole lot in new fences and we have not invested a whole lot in, in temporary water, li or water lines. I guess we do we do some garden hoses and stock tanks a little bit, but we don't have we haven't done a whole scale rehash of our farm watering system. And it hurts us in the winter, but but in the summer, rest of the year, we do a whole lot of really crooked, strange looking fields with poly wire. And so we kind of we have the water where it is, and we haven't made that investment to make water better. But I mean, anytime you see me in the summer, I'll have, I use the extension cord reels for my, roll my poly wire up. I'll have six or eight of those and 100 pigtails in the back of my truck. And we make pretty crazy alleys, but the, the livestock respect the electricity. And so we don't, we just haven't invested in more fences. And we just use a whole lot of poly wire where we probably, it'd be quicker and easier if we put up a couple of high tensile alleys and some waterways, it'd be quicker on a daily basis. But also, the other, the rest of the answer is not so much on the, uh, the equipment investment, but the time investment is I manage the cattle depending on what they need and what I'm trying to do. But so when I'm really busy planting, that's not when I'm mob grazing when I need to move cattle every day. I might move them three times a week that week. But then after I get my planning done, then that's when I'm gonna maybe do some mob grazing where I move them once a day or twice a day or something like that. So I kind of, I mean, that's part of it is everything we do on the farm, we don't do any of it to the optimal because we're doing so many different things. So that's kind of my compromise is um, there's times when, you know, the cattle get moved twice a week instead of, you know, every other day. I've kind of, generally speaking, um, with the whole way the, my, my ideal scenario is to move brood cows every, you know, cows every other day because they eat fresh green and then they eat more carbonaceous the second day. The rumen doesn't ever change. It kind of thinks it's the same thing. So that's my goal is every other day. That's kind of my ideal. But when I'm mobbing, I move them more often. Um, all that said, we did have two groups of cows, two groups of weanlings, two different farms, and we've combined groups. So we have one group of cows, one group of, of weanlings, a group of finishers. So we've actually reduced the number of groups to address exactly what you're asking. So I have fewer animals to move on a daily basis. So that's kind of been the compromise, of, you know, the workaround, I guess you could say. Um, so how large is our labor force? So uh, peak time, which is right before school starts back in August, between student labor and H2A labor, family, we probably feed lunch to 22 or 23 people right before school starts in August. Um, right now, it's myself, my sister, brother-in-law, and one or two 
our full-time year-end employees kind of varies, depends on if people are going back to school or they want to stay on all winter. This year we have a couple of year-rounders with us. Um, I do all the cattle moving and the pig moving. There's one guy that does the poultry. That's all he does. Um, kind of back to answer your question, the, the whole cattle rotation, I probably do it on average an hour and a half to two hours a day. It's probably what I spend moving cattle and or pigs. And I basically move, you know, a group of cows or sometimes two things a day, and sometimes it's just one, one group, one species. Let's thank John. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. I do have a couple of